You know, all we seem to hear about today is how humans are affecting climate. But there are many other factors that can affect climate, and that's what I'll be talking about in today's video. Well, one factor in particular, and that is plate tectonics. How plate tectonics or tectonic events in Earth's past have caused major global climate change. Before I jump right into the content, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. So make sure you stick around to the end of the video to hear about the amazing online learning opportunities that Brilliant offers. So starting with the very basics here, what is plate tectonics? Well, plate tectonics is the movement and interaction of Earth's lithospheric plates. Lithosphere is not, you know, equivalent to Earth's crust. It includes Earth's crust, but also part of the uppermost mantle. Um, but the lithosphere is what makes up the actual tectonic plates. And lithosphere that includes oceanic crust is denser and behaves differently than the lithosphere that includes continental crust, which is less dense and typically overrides plates like oceanic plates that go and subduct underneath continental crust. So there's these plate boundaries and all the lithospheric plates on Earth, which are outlined in this map here, kind of interact and push and pull um, against and from each other. And these interactions can affect climate over geologic time. And in this video, I'm going to be listing five major instances where tectonic activity or a specific tectonic event has greatly influenced global climate. However, I do want to note that plate tectonics is just one of many factors that influences climate and causes climate change over time. And other factors include atmospheric compositional changes, things like greenhouse gas concentrations, for example, solar radiation and differences in the distribution and amount of solar radiation received by Earth, which can be caused by things like astronomical factors. In other words, Earth's orbit, changes in Earth's orbit around the sun can change the distribution and amount of solar radiation received. Um, biology itself, life itself, can affect climate and has affected climate in big ways in Earth's past. For example, when photosynthesizers evolved and they produced oxygen for the first time, which hadn't really been around on early Earth, and that majorly changed the atmospheric composition. And so all these factors are kind of connected and they greatly affect climate together. It's not a system where one can really happen without affecting the other, so they're all very interconnected is the point. Also note that plate tectonics is something that takes a freaking long time. These plates are moving around, but very slowly on geologic timescales, not at all close to human timescales. We can actually track the movement of the plates on Earth today, and we see, you know, they're moving, I don't know what the actual rates are, maybe like a centimeter per decade. I'll look it up and actually like put it on the screen here if I find like the average plate movement speed, but it's very slow. So any actual significant movement and interaction of plates takes a very long geologic time, which means that it causes climate to change on a much longer time scale than other factors that might cause faster acting effects, such as changes in greenhouse gas concentration, for example. Any atmospheric compositional changes tend to much more quickly affect climate or change climate than plate tectonics, because plate tectonics just takes a long time to do anything um, significant. And for this reason, plate tectonics is actually never or typically not the sole cause of events like mass extinctions or other catastrophic events in Earth's history, uh, because slow change, I've talked about this many times in my videos, slow change does not harm life as much as fast change. That's why, you know, warmer periods in Earth's history, like the Mesozoic, for example, people always say, well, it was much warmer then, so why are we worried about it becoming warmer now? Well, it's the rate of change that's dangerous, not <laughs> the actual magnitude of the change, not the actual magnitude of the warming. The rate of warming or cooling or whatever it might be tends to be harmful to life because life at the time evolved to those conditions. So if there's a gradual change over geologic time, potentially caused by plate tectonics, life tends to evolve, adapt, and be fine. But if it's rapid and there's no time to evolve or adapt, then life will die, <laughs> and that causes mass extinction events. Um, but plate tectonics has been the trigger for certain climate changes that eventually lead to mass extinctions, but it's never the sole trigger or sole cause. 
So the first example of a major tectonic event that caused a major climate change event in Earth's history is way back early on Earth, around 800 to 750 million years ago when the supercontinent Rodinia broke up. And this caused major climate change because it greatly increased the rate of continental weathering at the time, which if you've seen any of my climate discussing videos, I talk about how weathering and an increase in weathering rates specifically causes an increase in the rates of carbon burial, which causes major typically cooling because it decreases the amount of atmospheric carbon available and it increases oxygen. So it causes cooling in association with oxygenation events, typically, um, if it's like a big enough event. And this was. The reason that continental weathering, specifically silicate weathering, the weathering of silicate minerals like basalts or other volcanic rocks, increases the rates of carbon burial is because it greatly increases the flux or amount of transport of ions like calcium to the ocean, which react with carbonate and form calcium carbonate. And that greatly pushes the equilibrium of CO2 versus carbonate minerals in the ocean toward the carbonate formation side of things. I have a video talking about that equilibrium reaction recently, and I'll link it to the top right. But basically, it pushes it toward carbonate formation rather than carbonate dissolution, which leads to more CO2 in the water. Um, and that causes a great decrease of carbon, carbon dioxide specifically, in the water as well as the atmosphere because it takes a lot of that to form these rocks and then they get buried and stay in the rock record for a long period of time which decreases atmospheric carbon for a long enough time to cause major cooling. And another thing that weathering facilitates is primary productivity in the oceans. In other words, things like algal blooms, which greatly increase the rates of organic carbon burial. So not only are you getting inorganic carbon precipitating, minerals forming and becoming buried and stored in the rock record, but also organic carbon deposits are becoming buried and stored in the rock record. And that's leading to an overall decrease of carbon in the atmosphere and ocean, leading to cooling and oxygen rise because typically the major sink for oxygen or major way that oxygen is used up is to oxidize organic carbon and if it's all getting buried or a lot of it's getting buried it's kind of escaping that oxidation leaving behind more oxygen in the oceans and atmospheres so anyway this contributed to a major cooling and oxygen rise period in earth's history called the neoproterozoic oxygenation event which i have a video on and i'll link to the top right for you but another reason that Rodinia and its associated tectonics led to, or eventually led to an increase in oxygen uh, in the atmosphere was because it, one, existed for a long time, and during this time, it had somewhat of an insulation effect that increased the mantle's temperature beneath the continent. So it was a supercontinent, and it's, uh, again, lithospheric are, are the plates, the lithosphere, and then below the lithosphere, we've got the rest of the mantle, and the mantle temperature beneath the continental mass was rising and surrounding the supercontinent were a bunch of subduction zones so again oceanic plates subduct underneath continental plates and this actually enhanced the heating effect that was already going on underneath the continental landmass because the subducting plates prevented any lateral mixing um, and so this lack of mixing not only caused this you know weird heat distribution but also led to the lack of reduction of the mantle material that was being brought down uh, in the subducting plates. In other words, that just means that this oxidized material from the surface, which was oxidized by compounds like oxygen and other oxidized things at Earth's surface, didn't become reduced again. And those are just fancy chemical words for like having more electrons versus not having a lot. Things at the Earth's surface tend to be oxidized. Things below Earth's surface tend to be reduced um, because the oxygen and other oxidized compounds don't get down there. But subducting plates do bring them down there and typically they get remixed and re-reduced and it all comes back to a relatively reduced state and then it's brought to the surface and oxidized. But in this case, it wasn't. And so the volcanism that resulted from the subducting plates as shown by this figure here um, basically was bringing back back up oxidized magma and gas. And so it was already oxidized and then it was, you know, extruded out of these volcanoes and it was again expelling the already oxidized gas, which 
again, also increased the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere because oxygen was not then being used to oxidize the gas, which it typically is with volcanic gas um, because it was already oxidized. So <laughs> all that is to say, Rodinia and its involved tectonics led to this neoproterozoic oxygenation event that happened to occur right before the explosion of animal life in the Ediacaran and Cambrian. So it was likely a big driver of that. So this tectonic event here with Rodinia and its breakup is really key to animal evolution. So it might seem like something that was just geological or whatever, but all of these things are combined and linked and it then led to something that was biological and biochemical. And so all of these things are very linked is the point. And I think it's incredible and I hope you do too. The second major tectonic event I want to talk about in this video that led to major climate change was the formation of Gondwana. Rodinia broke up and then led to a kind of another intermediate supercontinent called Pinocha, which then kind of broke up and led to Laurentia and Gondwana and Baltica. These were kind of the three major continental landmasses after uh, Pinocha broke up. But when Gondwana moved over the South Pole or kind of positioned a little bit more over the South Pole in the Ordovician period, it contributed to the cooling event that kicked off the Ordovician mass extinctions around 460 million years ago. There's three major reasons why this caused cooling. One, glaciation spread just due to its southern position, but this also led to a decrease in sea level, which exposed more land and increased weathering rates. Again, increasing weathering rates lead to more carbon burial, leading to cooling. But another thing that contributed to the increasing weathering rates was the movement of continents through the intertropical convergence zone, which increased how much rainfall was falling on the continental land masses, which, you know, rain increases weathering greatly and chemical weathering and transport of those ions to the water where they react and precipitate carbon bearing minerals. So this Gondwana movement slash increasing weathering rate event led to this cooling, but these extinction events were associated with two pulses of extinctions and climate change events. One was the cooling and the second was a warming pulse. And so if you wanna know more about how the Ordovician mass extinctions progressed and what you know climate changes led to what climate feedbacks that caused the next pulse or whatever, I talk more about that in my Ordovician mass extinction event video, which I'll link to the top right if you wanna check it out. The third major tectonic event or events uh, that led to major climate change are collisions involving Laurentia. So yes, we talked about Gondwana. It was an amalgamation of a bunch of big land masses today and was huge throughout the entire, oh gosh, from about 500 million years ago to 300-ish million years ago when Pangaea started forming. But it was a major thing that had major importance and control on climate throughout the early to mid Paleozoic. But Laurentia was not small by any means, nor was its effect on climate. It underwent several collisions throughout the Paleozoic, which eventually closed a major ocean basin, the Raic Ocean, and formed the Appalachian Mountains. The closure of this ocean and the formation of this major mountain range greatly altered atmospheric and oceanic circulation and thus global climate. But this was a stepwise process. There were multiple collision events that eventually led to the ocean closure and the mountains formation. And these events included the Taconic orogeny, the Acadian orogeny, and the Alleghenian orogeny. I hope I am pronouncing Taconic better. I don't know. I had a commenter um, tell me how to pronounce it more correctly, and I hope I'm getting it right. But pronunciations through text are difficult to comprehend, so let me know if that was correct this time. In any case, this first stage of mountain building involved the collision of Laurentia with an island arc. This second stage also involved the collision and accretion of an island arc onto Laurentia. And the third stage finally set in the collision of Gondwana with Laurentia, which was the event that led to the beginning of Pangaea's formation, the major supercontinent that existed thereafter until the Mesozoic when it began to break up. Which brings us to our fourth tectonic event that affected climate, and that is the formation of this major supercontinent. Pangaea. Pangaea began forming around 320 to 300 million years ago as Gondwana and Laurentia 
Laurentia collided, and this actually led to the largest ice age of the Phanerozoic Eon. In other words, the largest ice age within the last 500-ish million years ago, and some major mass extinctions at the time. Not one of the big five mass extinctions, uh, but a, a mass extinction event, no less. System changes, and because the Carboniferous was previously and mostly known for its globally widespread coal swampy environments, <laughs> Climatic drying or increased aridity that the supercontinent Pangaea brought with it greatly contracted these coal swamps and this contributed to mass extinctions, but it also did eventually cause enough of a decrease in carbon burial to bring us out of the ice age and into a period of warming, which eventually led to the greatest extinction event of all time, or a greatest extinction event of the Phanerozoic Eon at the end Permian, which was not only caused by the warming uh, due to the contraction of coal swamps, but also major volcanism, uh, which I talk about in my video about that extinction event, which I'll link up here if you want to check it out. Pangaea then began breaking up in the latest part of the Permian around 250 million years ago. This might have actually contributed to triggering the volcanism that I just mentioned that caused, or in part, caused the climate changes that led to the greatest mass extinction event of all time at the end of Permian. Um, but there's also other hypotheses regarding how this volcanism was kind of triggered and started um, in the Siberian traps, but it's possible the early rifting of Pangaea did um, help to trigger these massive volcanic eruptions. However, Pangaea did remain relatively intact throughout the Triassic period after the end of the Permian, so it didn't do that much rifting, if any, uh, at the late Permian, uh, early Triassic time, but later in the Triassic, in the late Triassic, or end Triassic around 200 million years ago, that is when the real rifting began in the Central Atlantic, uh, where now the Mid-Atlantic Ridge is. The faults or kind of breaks and slippage and rocks in this region due to this tectonic rifting or tectonic extension or breaking apart of the plates allowed magma through to seep through and form dikes and sills. Dikes and sills are when magma comes up and, and dikes are like these vertical shoots of magma that come up and then cool like just below Earth's crust and then they're uplifted and we can see there was like a a shoot of magma that went through these rock layers, or a sill is kind of the same thing as a dike, but horizontal, it kind of seeps through um, horizontal rock layers. And an example of a sill here is uh, one of the largest sills in the world, the Palisades Sill along the Hudson River, which is actually part of the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, which formed and, and erupted during this time in the end Triassic because of the rifting apart of Pangaea. This major volcanic activity greatly increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, led to warming, led to ocean anoxia, and actually greatly contributed to the end Triassic mass extinctions, another major mass extinction event uh, that I have talked about and I'll link the video up here to the top right for you. I'm not trying to like just send you to all my other videos, but I have talked about this and you know, if you want to know more, there you go. Uh <laughs> But this breakup did not just lead to kind of bad climate changes that led to mass extinctions, but also led to eventually a great diversification of life uh, in the Cenozoic. So the breakup of Pangaea ultimately in the long term and not the initial volcanism that it caused, but the splitting of the continental land masses ultimately led to more speciation. In other words, more geographical isolation of species and therefore uh, the formation of new species over time for mammals in the Cenozoic. And as we all know, after the end of the non-avian dinosaurs, after the Mesozoic, the mammals took over in the Cenozoic and a large part of the great diversification of mammals during the Cenozoic and still today is because of the big split in continental land masses that occurred, allowing there to be more uh, and more rapid speciation. So those are five examples of how plate tectonic events in the past have contributed greatly to affecting global climate change, but why is it so important that we study 
how plate tectonics in the past has worked and how it's affected climate. Well, it's basically key for us to understand how plate tectonic works on modern Earth and how these tectonic events and this tectonic movement that's currently happening might affect climate or other Earth processes in the future. And the way that we study this involves a lot of data analysis, probabilities, statistics, modeling, and you might think that these sound like skills that are really hard to get or you can only get if you're a research scientist, but you can actually gain these skills as a regular person by using Brilliant. Brilliant offers really fun and interactive lessons for learning things like data analysis, probability statistics, all of these skills can be gained from using Brilliant. And it's really time effective too. It does not take a lot of your time out of your day to hop on Brilliant and do a fun interactive lesson for 10 minutes. Brilliant has thousands of courses that don't feel like courses at all. Just the other day I went on Brilliant just to take a break and have some fun, and at the same time I was learning something new, which I know you guys in my audience love to learn new things because you watch my videos. <laughs> so if you want to go learn new things in a fun and a little bit more interactive way than my videos can be, you can head over to Brilliant at brilliant.org slash geogirl, which is linked in my pinned comment, for 30 free days on Brilliant and 20% off an annual plan. So go to brilliant.org slash geogirl for this amazing discount and start learning right away. With that, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Thank you, Brilliant, so much for sponsoring this video. And as always, my references are linked down below. If you want to stick with me after you go over to Brilliant and do your quick and fun and interactive lesson, you can watch this video next, which is five more times plate tectonics has affected climate because I couldn't fit them all in one video. Um, if it's out by now, I'll put it up here. If it's not out by now, it might be members only right now. But once it's out for the public, you can head over there and watch that. I'll see you guys there. Bye.